How about now? Is that better? Okay. All right, welcome to tonight's lecture. Um, I'm Beth Cole, in our section section. Tonight we welcome to the KSA, Kai Hude Bergman, director of the RKA Eagle School. Um, this lecture, by the way, is eligible for continuing after credit. So I believe there's a sign outside the back doors if you're interested. Our big lecture has been a long time coming. Um, so it's really great to have you here tonight, um, despite the fact that as of a few days ago, um, I was there. New York office, yes. Hi there. So uh, this was me four days ago. Um, take a look at Manhattan. There was actually an entirely new neighborhood that was created. And uh, it was called Soho, South of Power. Um, I was uh, sadly living and working in Soho. Uh, and what basically, uh, what this really brings to, uh, to everyone's attention is that we have now experienced two 100-year storms in two years, with Hurricane Irene last year and Hurricane uh, Sandy this year. Um, and you can also see uh, when the governor, Cuomo, of New York, basically comes out and says, listen folks, this is, the, the, this is climate. This is climate change. This is." Uh, the warming, this is the changing of sort of weather patterns. We haven't seen anything like this. The subway, which is 108 years old, has never been flooded. And there, suddenly, the entire city, or you could say that the island felt like an island. Even Brooklyn felt like an island because it was suddenly cut off from, uh, from the entire transit uh, system. 
So what SOHO, and in this case, Hurricane Sandy, and now a nor'easter that's hitting it just uh, again, I have no idea if I'm actually going home tomorrow or not. So I might be coming in for Chris. <laughs> is, uh, is really kind of a wake-up call. And um, it's something that I think that all of us, especially you, who now will have an impact on architecture and thinking uh, over the next uh, 40, 50, or even 60 years, uh, need to really uh, start to uh, think about. Um, the way that we actually think about, say, uh, resource planning, or the way that we think about energy use, um, even climactic sort of conditions, is that we, we talk about it in terms of energy loops. And that in today's world, the way that we build our cities, our buildings, we oftentimes just create the energy once, use the energy, and then we basically dump whatever the refuse is or whatever the waste product is of that energy. And what we like to promote is actually the idea that you can actually create energy loops where the waste product of one cycle becomes the, basically the, the, the feeding of another loop. So imagine that you could create energy, use it once, use it twice, three times, four times. As an example, when you go to the supermarket, you buy frozen chicken. Now you go, you buy the frozen chicken, those refrigerators actually create heat. That's the process. That heat currently is dumped out of most supermarkets. You can actually go walking out behind the supermarket and you just get blasted with hot air. Now, that seems incredibly wasteful. What if we actually put a swimming pool on top of our supermarkets, pump the frozen chicken air into the pool and have a heated pool in Columbus, Ohio, in the midst of winter? So why can't we actually think about shaping our cities, shaping our buildings programmatically such that you can actually start to really sort of think about how the energy is used inside them. So this is something that we really spend a lot of time with and I'll show you some projects that actually take this thinking uh, into it. And we call it hedonistic sustainability. The idea that sustainability doesn't have to hurt. It doesn't mean taking cold showers or taking fewer flights. It's not about giving up something. It's actually hedonistic in the sense that you're increasing the quality of life. And doing so, you're actually making things more economical, more efficient, more sort of useful in this kind of uh, energy loop idea. This is 2009 in Copenhagen. There was a climate conference, and it was done by the UN. This is the moment that all of these leaders from Europe, from America, from, uh, from, from Asia as well, we're sitting in a room, and at this very moment, they realized it was going to be a disaster. They weren't going to actually come to any type of agreement or deal with the problems that they had been discussing for two weeks prior to this moment. And so it's basically that we now realize that we neither have the institutions internationally, like the UN, and neither do we have the national leadership to deal with these issues. But that doesn't mean that you have to just sort of say, I'm sorry, and you're screwed. Actually, the responsibility falls lower to regional thinking, to mayor mayoral thinking, to you. We now have the responsibility of actually trying to do something and dealing with sort of these issues of how to use our resources. That means that actually getting involved in policy, getting involved in sort of big picture thinking, so Bjarke is here in the EU Parliament, taking part in discussions about how can architects actively become involved in sort of uh, resource management. Um, here he was at the Downing Street, uh, David Cameron, talking about how to use public space in cities so that you don't end up with lots of riots, like you did uh, about a summer ago. So it's, it's really the idea that you actually become a participant in actually thinking on a large scale about systems, systematic thinking, becoming involved in terms of uh, what are the underlying sort of rules and regulations that actually uh, affect every single project that you're going to be involved in. So uh, Bjarke, Bjarke Engels Group, big, 
we got invited to this project. This woman has literally one of the unsexiest jobs on the planet. She's basically a director of a waste energy plant. It takes our waste in Copenhagen and turns it into electricity. So they had a competition for a waste to energy plant. And uh, in the brief, if you read the last sentence, it says, the plant should be architecture that should be a gift to the city. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've never heard energy plant, architecture, gift, and city in the same sentence. So the ambition that she had as a director to actually create something that is urban, that architects can actually work with uh, the building and the mass and trying to make sure that it actually is something that the city wants was, was very, very sort of high ambition. This is what most energy plants look like. Anywhere in the world, they're boxes with smokestacks. And they're usually designed by engineers. Architects very rarely get involved other than choosing a facade element or a facade uh, texture or color. So what was it about this project specifically that asked for an architect to be sort of become involved? So when you look at Denmark, it's a small country, five and a half million people. Um, there's not much land. They all sort of live pretty tightly compact. Um, there's no place to actually put the waste. So there, they burn waste into energy, 54% of all waste. They recycle 42%, and only 4% goes into the ground. If you now look at America, look at us, 99% of all of our waste gets scooped under the ground. And let others worry about it. Now, if I were to actually tell you that that waste that you've just scooped under the ground actually is energy, then why are we spending tons of money to go get energy from other places when we actually have that energy right here at home? And we just need to create the systems to actually tap into that energy. So again, you have a country that doesn't have a lot of land. They have 16 of these uh, plants spread out throughout the entire country. And the one that we're gonna be looking at is the one with the circle. This is downtown Copenhagen right here, and that's the site of the plant. So 400,000 tons of waste go in, and 550,000 people get their electricity from that waste. Now, if you take a look, the site is actually pretty close to downtown, and buildings are starting to get built up around it, and this is where the queen lives. Her bedroom window looks out at this plant, so of course it's gotta look good. Um, the building itself would be the largest building built in Denmark in terms of volume and also in terms of height. So it's 100 meters tall and uh, it's just a very, very large building. Right now, Danes, they, because it's very flat in Denmark, so they get into a car, they drive eight hours to Sweden, they go skiing down this hill, it's about a 120 meter drop, and then they drive eight hours back. Now think about that sustainably. Eight hours of driving, skiing for a day, eight hours back. Sounds like a pretty big footprint. So we imagined, what if we already have a 100 meter tall building, what if we graft the ski slope on top of the energy plant? So we have mountains of dirt, uh, trash. We love mountains of snow, why not combine the two? So our competition entry, basically, this is what we needed to basically cover, or what we needed to uh, uh, house. This is what we envisioned was to create this kind of amenity for the rest of the city. We have green slope, blue slope, black diamond slope. You take the elevator to the top, there's a panoramic restaurant, uh, and then you create lots of activities around that facility so that the entire district or area sort of becomes a recreational site. So here we have the, the project and we won the competition uh, a little over a year ago and it's going to be built. So it just went through a year-long political process, got uh, about a month ago it got uh, it's okay and we are in the midst of doing a sort of uh, schematic design. Now Denmark has the climate of skiing but not the topography. So it snows three to four months out of the year and it would be perfect. It would be like natural snow and you're, and you're uh, skiing down. But what do you do during the summer months? Well, we envision bikini boarding 
uh, because you actually can use a synthetic snow that's made up of like pop bottles recycled into snowflakes. And imagine this is the south of France. This is a pile of trash in the south of France. And they have a ski slope with moguls, half pipes, and it's been there for 10 years. People go there, Olympic teams go there to practice in the summer months. So it's, it's a viable technology. And that's how we envision sort of placing that on top and when the natural snow comes, then the natural snow actually sits on top of the synthetic snow. So um, it's going to really, in, in a way, brand the city. Um, and even the mayor is very, very excited that this project actually is moving ahead. So it, it, it's not only about architecture, it's also about how the city sees itself. And that suddenly even more people, common people, who have nothing to do or have never thought about the architecture of the city, suddenly are a part and very excited about what is happening in the city. Now, all of us here can change our habits, but we only change our habits if we actually have information. If we don't get information, then why would we ever change to something else? And when you see a smokestack today with the smoke just sort of pouring out of it in a, in a long line, you have no idea what actually is coming out of it. You have no idea the quantity there's no way for you to figure out what is happening inside that, uh, in, uh, that plant. So we had this idea of actually creating smoke rings. That every time there was a ton of carbon burned inside the plant, that we basically puff out a smoke ring. So when you're sitting there with your boyfriend or girlfriend and you say, look dear, there's three tons of carbon that just burned inside the plant. <laughs> and uh, that, when the puffs start happening you know, faster and faster, you're like, dear, I think we should change our lifestyle. Um, so, uh, so it's really about c communicating with uh, the entire city at a city scale, communicating what's happening inside that plant. So here's the idea, the process is to sort of capture the air vapor um, and then through hydraulics to sort of push it out from the smokestack. So this is a project that we actually worked together on with um, Realities United in Berlin. And, uh, and that's still uh, a part of the project. When you come 2017 to Copenhagen, please bring your skis. Uh, you're gonna be able to uh, ski down uh, the, uh, the energy plant. So a couple of views from the, the, uh, the plant. It's uh, just south of downtown. This is actually a, a, a real smoke ring from Mount Etna. There's a, when Mount Etna erupts, there's a, uh, there's a little area that kind of puffs out smoke rings because of the way that it's actually structured. And these are different views from, from around the city. So, um, that is in a way an idea about how do we as architects become involved with projects that are perhaps not considered architectural, or you know, this is energy systems. This is really sort of a big type, and, and our future is going to be driven by where we get our energy from. I don't know if uh, there were any discussions here in the US, but when Fukushima happened in Japan, and you had the nuclear disaster after the tsunami, um, in Europe, people really started having big conversations about getting rid of nuclear power. So you have the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, saying that by 2022, we're going to get rid of all nuclear power. Well, we have 2012 today, 25% of all German energy throughout for, for 80 plus million people comes from nuclear power. That means in 10 years, in half of a generation, they want to find new sources for 25% of what they actually use. Either they're going to use less or they have, to use, they have to find new energy sources. So the discussions of trash, of sun, solar, of wind, um, all of these things, of coal, of course, all of these things are huge discussions that I think we should also be having here in the United States. And especially if you now know that you can actually get electricity the lights on from your trash that you're throwing away, I think you should also be talking to people here in the city 
about not dumping it into landfills outside of the city. So this is another project. It's not an architectural project, it's a research project. And it too also is about how to expand what an architect can actually do. And that we actually have skills that allow us to really get involved in a much broader range of, of thinking. So Audi, the car company, German car company, comes to us and says, uh, we have a problem. And we're like, you have a problem? You're selling more cars this year than in your entire history. Well, that's true. So you're making uh, more money than you've ever made. That's also true. Um, what's the problem? Well, you architects, whenever you guys show the future of what's going to be in 50 years, there's like really happy people smiling riding bicycles. And there's like no cars in any of your renderings. And we're like, uh, okay. And you live in Copenhagen. Like, you know, almost 40% of people are biking to work. And they're making it more and more difficult for cars to actually be in the city. So they came to Copenhagen to talk to an architect about the future because they're afraid that in the future there will be no more cars. The cities will actually close themselves off to cars. Congestion taxi, which is happening in London, in Stockholm, in Singapore, in different places. It's, you have to pay to actually drive downtown. So um, they want us to actually say how we could actually see having cars in the future. So um, we, we took that challenge and we said, OK, let's take a look. Audi, the four rings, are actually four different car companies that all assimilated together at the beginning of the 20th century. So they, the four rings are actually four separate companies come together to create the, the big company of Audi. Um, and they're very uh, proud that th throughout their entire history, they have sort of created technological uh, advancements. And they've dr sort of been driven by doing things uh, with, a, with a lot of technique. And, uh, and they always said of themselves, we're a car company. And we were like, that's exactly what you're not. You're not a car company. You're a mobility company. You make sure that people can get from point A to point B. So why don't you think about Audi bikes, or Audi trains, <laughs> or Audi blades? So think about creating an Audi experience that could be on any number of wheels. Maybe you have that fresh car smell, you know, in a train, or you have that sound of a, of a door slamming shut uh, in, in a small little uh, sort of urban bike, uh, bikester or roadster, so that you're actually creating the, the, the quality that they really care about and the technological advancement, but it could be across a broad range of mobile options. Then they were pretty interested and they said, tell us more. So we said, what about driverless cars? where the car is now so advanced, it's now so hooked up to, to, uh, to the uh, GPS and to each other that the cars can actually communicate with each other and figure out how to get from one point to the other uh, in a much more efficient way than, than the way that we would. This is, the, this is our life today. We're just building more and more roads and we're making more and more congestion and there's no real answer to the congestion, except for building more and more lanes. So if uh, we're actually looking for something that actually solves this issue of people moving around, if we take a look at driverless sort of advancements, back in the 70s, people started putting computers and cars together. And Basically, over the last 30 to 40 years, there have been these advancements. So you have actually the Google car now that is actually driving or has driven itself almost 100,000 miles across uh, the country. Back in 95, which isn't too long ago, you had a car that drove 5,000 kilometers across the U.S. Uh, without uh, a driver. The, the year following that, they had eight cars on the same system. Now, take a, note, take a look at the distance of these cars from each other. Because it's now that all the cars are communicating with each other, that they are able to sort of take a distance that's a lot more efficient, a lot more rational. Now the only reason that this car, let's say I'm driving here,
and this car, the only reason to have this distance is because of how bad this person drives. <laughs> it's not me, right? So it's because the irrational behavior of us, human, with another driver, that's the reason that you need that distance. So if you take that irrationality out of it, then you can create much more efficient use of our current system, our, our road systems. So if we take a look at the, the sort of the advancements of the cars, we've been on driverless metros and subways for decades. We even allow you know, the computer to fly us around on cruise control, uh, no problem. Uh, Tom Cruise has been on cruise control for decades. <laughs> Um, and, you know, cars are becoming more and more automated. You have uh, automated brakes, you have automated uh, self-parking uh, systems. So you have a lot of different um, sort of systems that are taking over. Cars are becoming cyborgs in, in a way. And if we take a look at how cities have structured themselves based on mobility, this is Barcelona and it's designed for the foot. So everyone was walking from one place to the other in this city. Same city, Barcelona, but now there was the horse and the carriage. So suddenly the Barcelona block was born. And blocks became a great way of actually allowing air and light into cities. Um, we then go kind of a few hundred years later, and we have the metro, the subway. This is Moscow, which had an extensive subway system where people would basically come out of the subway station and then they would enter into a park because all of the housing developments were really green uh, garden cities around the, around the interior core. And then you had you know, housing blocks inside the park. So it, it's a different structure. Then we have Los Angeles, which is built entirely after the car sort of came into being. And uh, the, the, you know, Los Angeles is very much driven by, um, by the car and, and uh, what it, its impact to the city structure. If we now just take this intersection of the 405 and the 10, and we compare it to the downtown of Copenhagen. So any of you folks who've been there, take a look at how much space we give to an interchange of actually just moving a car in four different directions. It's huge. And how much you've lost actually in terms of the urban space, the urban quality, and the distance that you now have to actually travel to go from any place to the other. So it's all about speed, because speed tells you how long or distance you need to actually change direction or change a lane. Um, we've allowed sort of engineers, traffic engineers, to tell us how our cities should be laid out. And for the past, 50, 60 years, we've given over to those traffic engineers to basically design. And our question is, is that what we want? Do we want still for traffic engineers to tell architects how to build? Or do we as architects have also an ability to influence how we use our transportation systems? In, in 1900, you were able to move around London at 16 kilometers an hour. Today, if you were to try to go through London, you're moving at around 16 kilometers an hour. So it's like 110 years and very little improvement. So we actually want to improve the quality of moving through the city and actually getting from place to place. So we're looking at, here is a study of just the same group of people, but using different modes of transportation, bikes, cars, and public bus. And here is just a study of how much space a person needs in these different modes of transportation. So the single person in the car needs 60 square meters um, as they're tra traveling through uh, a city. Here we have that sort of argument of four cars that need a certain distance between themselves and 10 cars that are able to, almost in the same amount of space, uh, get much more compact. And if we take a look at what, you know, we have basically urban structure, buildings take up almost 60%. We have the sort of the sidewalks around. 15% uh, is just roads, asphalt, <coughs> concrete. And if we were now to actually take that over to a driverless 
uh, scenario, we could do the same amount of cars that we now have 15% in five. Now we have 10% left over for growth, population growth. What are you gonna do with more people? Are you just gonna keep building more lanes? So you now have the ability to actually have a little bit of room, gasket. Or you could create financing systems to actually create an entirely new road network. So you start selling off some of this land and now you have money to actually invest in the new system. So if we're saying that this is kind of our current condition, you come up to an intersection and you have certain rules and regulations of how to actually move through that intersection, why not actually in the future think about moving much more like swarms of fish. You put in the address that you want to go to, that car starts to move around, it reacts with all the cars that are around it, and you sort of move around the space uh, in, a, in a sort of much more uh, flexible uh, way. Now, if you look at Manhattan as a kind of bird's eye view, you, you get into a cab, you tell the cab driver where you want to go, you don't drive, you just tell them where you want to go, and you get driven through the city, and the cab driver decides based on all the information that uh, he or she is getting as to which streets to take and how to get there in the best uh, uh, possible time. So we actually already have a model on a citywide perspective of what this quality uh, could be like of getting into cars and letting them drive you. So Audi was actually really kind enough to actually allow us to test out what, uh, what this would be. And we, this is a smart street. And what basically is happening is that there are cameras that are picking up all of the different information. And the car is driving, that's the arrows, and it's reacting to all of the different dynamic information that's coming into it. So as the person gets closer, the car veers away. Or if there's an obstruction in front of it, it stops. And so it's really, imagine creating roads that suddenly all the cars can move in during the day in the morning and all the lanes are going or most of the lanes are going in and then they reverse in the afternoon as the people are actually exiting the city. So the idea here is to really create um, a new type of pavement or a new type of movement uh, that allows you to think on a much larger scale. So um, we'd like to now do this actually for a city block in Manhattan where we would just build the, the smart street and allow New Yorkers to actually see what, uh, what this could be. So those are two projects, energy systems, transportation systems, no architecture yet, um, that basically also talk about this idea of yes is more. This, this idea that we're surrounded so much by sort of negativity uh, in our life. Uh, we're told by clients, uh, can't do that, uh, don't have money for that. The city basically says, don't build so high or so fat. Uh, and the people who use these buildings say, uh, not in my backyard. And so we're confronted uh, so much with that kind of negativity that what we look for is really to do projects that think about uh, and to challenge and to excite uh, a client into actually digging a little bit deeper or the city to provide a few more variances uh, or most importantly, the people who are using the buildings to actually turn from NIMBYs to WIMBYs and say, that's what we want in our backyard. And to really engage all of those different viewpoints into a project and allow the work to actually empower everybody into thinking uh, positively about the process. And so uh, the Yes is More book kind of like looks at 35 projects and goes through them and kind of details the stories behind each project of how it kind of came against that negativity and then tried to channel it into kind of a positive process. Um, this is our uh, office, or actually it was, uh, this is actually, we, we take uh, big pretty seriously, some of us in uh, our hairstyles, but uh, this is a, an office that we just moved from and uh, we're just moving right now in Copenhagen into this space. It's an old uh, factory building, as you can see. And um, in New York, this is the building that uh, has been flooded and uh, still is uh, without power in, uh, on West 26th in Chelsea. Uh, so we're hoping to uh, get power pretty soon. 
our process is very iterative. So uh, as I saw in your school here, you have some great um, modeling capabilities. We build lots of models. We do a lot of prototyping. Uh, we're, we're sort of going through a lot of different ideas and then find sort of an evolutionary process, the concept, and sort of as it kind of gets refined and matures into something. The other thing that you can see here is that all of our storage is visual. So we can see the work of the past uh, 12 years. And uh, that's also very exciting. If you were to come to Big Now, um, you kind of are surrounded by the, the thoughts and the experiences and the results of the past 12 years. So that right immediately you can actually absorb that, soak that in, and start off any project with those ideas already percolating out there. And uh, we, we're not afraid that, that a project that didn't make it in a competition, that the thinking doesn't mean that, you know, because we didn't win, doesn't mean that the thinking was false or wrong. Many of those thoughts actually still are valid and have merit. So we try to find ways to actually incorporate the work that we did in a previous project that didn't happen into something else. Because even today, I can say that only about 20% of the projects that we actually start actually get built. So that's, you know, you have to sort of allow for the other 80% to still be kind of productive and a, a sort of positive uh, influence on the work that you're doing. So uh, Bjark is taking a look at the Danish pavilion, and I'm going to show that a little bit later. So just some projects in Copenhagen. I know that many of you guys were actually on a trip to Copenhagen this past summer, um, so that's great. And you might have seen these things actually up close and personal. I hope so. This is um, the VM houses that were completed uh, under plot in 2005. And then this is uh, 2008, uh, the Mountain Project, just adjacent to it. Same client, same consultant group that worked on it. Um, and maybe what this project kind of um, should demonstrate is that uh, it's in a very uh, master planned uh, part of town in Copenhagen. And um, I think that what you should see master plans as are guidelines but not prescriptions. They're not telling you what has to be, they're giving you a guide as to what could be. So we always start a conversation with the city uh, on behalf of the client to sort of find out what are the client's ambitions and needs, what is the city trying to do with the master plan, and to sort of figure something out. If it's not working, then let's create a model that could work. So here, the city said, we want a parking garage, which is the yellow part, and we want a housing project next to it. And then we said, but it's very sad to be in the sort of the bottom uh, three to four floors looking directly into a parking garage. That's not very, uh, not very nice. And those units are probably not going to sell uh, as, as housing units. So we said, city, would you allow us to sort of place the parking as a base, as a foundation, place the housing on top, uh, cut away uh, basically the site so that these buildings that we built before still retain their views and then place 80 housing units on top of the parking. And the city couldn't argue with the ideas because they actually were pretty strong and they made a better building. So we call this programmatic alchemy where you take two different programs you put them together and they create something that's better than either of them would do alone. And um, so in this case, uh, this project, uh, as I said, 2008, basically you come into a housing unit and then the roof of your neighbor below is your outdoor terrace. And instead of having a postage stamp little balcony to go out and smoke cigarettes, you now have like a very sort of leisurely 600 square feet that you can actually invite friends over and do a barbecue. So it's just also allowing people to have, uh, enjoy their space and their life. So this, these, two, these two projects are right here. And this is a brand new development in Copenhagen. And what you could say is that right in this image, you kind of have two visions of the future. In the 1960s and 70s, this is what the vision of the future was. Everyone living in a suburban house single family detached with a yard, 
and sort of having their own little place. Well, Copenhagen, as I already mentioned, is a very tiny spot. There's not that much land. And you could quickly and easily fill up all of this green space and make it look just like that. And the city would grow and things would get further, far, further away from each other. So the city basically said, oops, we can't do this. So in the 90s, they basically stopped giving out permits for suburban sprawl. And they basically said, we got to think of something. So they created a very dense master plan where there would be basically 40,000 people living in the future. All the buildings had to be a minimum of 11 stories tall. And they would create parks. They would have a shopping mall. They would have office space. They would have a school, a high school. And they would basically create, from scratch, a brand new city. And it would be connected into the city by a metro. The metro runs 24 hours, seven days a week, every six minutes. So you basically don't worry about a timetable because you just walk up, something comes, picks you up, and you head into town. It's like 10 minutes into town from here. So they basically made it so easy for people to sort of access the town that um, people started shifting their ideas for the future. Now, if you ask a family with a baby, they would prefer to actually live in this building and have all of this park and green space uh, and have a school that they uh, really uh, enjoy than to actually live in that single family detached. So it's really a shifting of actually people's perception of what is, um, what is uh, the future. The mountain is called the mountain because uh, the parking garage needed to be ventilated, so we had to perforate the metal panels. And uh, we found a perforation, similar to like these perforated panels, we found a perforation company that had six different size holes. And then we gave him a picture of Mount Everest, and he could punch Mount Everest into the 3,000 panels. Um, this is the underneath the housing. This is the actual parking garage. And uh, you can see that you're actually parking on the ramp. So this is a ramp that goes up seven stories. And then you just park your car off that ramp. Uh, there's also a, a funicular, or like a, um, a, a diagonal uh, uh, elevator that takes you into all of the different units. Um, because 80 units, by using uh, standard up and down elevators, we were going to have to use seven up and down elevators. And there's no client you're going to ever find that's going to pay for seven elevators for 80 units. So he basically put us back to the drawing board and said, figure it out. So then we decided, oh, but if we do a funicular, we can do it with one elevator. Now, Denmark doesn't have a company that creates inverted or, or, or uh, uh, funicular elevators. So we actually had to call Switzerland with mountains, where they actually had the need for it, to actually order one. So it's also that maybe you don't have the solution where you are, but maybe the solution exists somewhere else, and you have to find it. So um, that's what was built. And then as you go into your unit from the car garage, then you sort of come into these sort of neutral units, hardwood floors, where the focus is all about the outdoors. And you can just sort of go from indoor to outdoor. And you really have those 600 square feet. And the idea is to sort of take the really the nice qualities of suburbia um, and bring them 10 floors up. So it's, it's about really taking the, the really great qualities of this house, this suburban house, and then make it more dense. Um, but we don't want to, we want to think about density, but we don't want to lose intimacy. So we also want to make sure that the people who are living more dense also have their private sphere, their private place. So basically on these, um, on these units, if you're on the wooden platform, none of your neighbors can see you because there's a very uh, broad kind of uh, hedge right here. So if I'm standing here, I can't look into my neighbor's uh, wooden platform. But if I go out onto the grass, then I'm suddenly a part of the entire uh, community. And I can basically see everyone when I'm on the, on the grass. So uh, this building, uh, led our client to purchase this piece of property. So the two buildings are up here. This is the southern portion of this new city. 
It's actually the southernmost station right here. This is where Copenhagen stops. And it's called the Eight House, and we finished it in 2010. So it's the last kind of, uh, one of the last projects that we've completed. Um, if you imagine that it was built during the crisis, 500 units, so almost 1,000 people are living there. And uh, this is a little video that shows kind of the process of how this project came into being. So here's our front door to our old uh, office space. That's our model shop right there. So, what's really interesting with these movies is that we don't make these movies at the end of a project as a marketing film. We actually are using these animations, these videos, as a means to explain the project to the city when we've, we've just created the concept, to each other, to the consultants that we want to work with. So it's actually a communicative de uh, uh, device. And it allows for the client to ask for variances from the city in a way that the city can actually understand what the variance is all about. So Bjarke is going to sort of uh, explain uh, the project. This is Copenhagen and you have the canal running through. The green place is the land that is now protected, that will never be built on. And our site is that orange uh, area where the, the green um, space is. So this is the new town that's being developed, the 40,000 people. The red are the metro lines, where our site is at the end of one of those metro lines. And uh, the city actually wanted to sell, uh, the plot was actually 100, 1 million square feet. And uh, our client didn't have enough money for a, a million square feet. So the first thing that he had to do was to kind of negotiate with the city to break the piece up into two parcels, one of uh, 400,000, the other one of 600,000. And then he was going to purchase the 600,000. Uh, the city said, okay. So if we take a look at the 600,000, the city wanted basically a perimeter block with a little thing at the top. And then we said, things aren't architecture. Uh, little towers, uh, skinny towers with a plaza around it, that's architecture. So we were basically negotiating with the city to change the master plan and then giving good reasons for it. Uh, we used kind of historical references, in this case, San Marco and Venice, and to talk about the qualities that we're trying to create around the plaza and uh, using references of sort of past Copenhagen Towers as being very skinny and sort of uh, uh, wayfinding orientation devices around the city and saying that that's the quality that we want to actually give to this tower. So the city is listening, is looking, and when the arguments are actually intelligent, thought through, and it's a better idea, the city is actually allowing us to change, to morph the existing master plan. So uh, in this case, you have a, a residential tower where all of the units at the top are, of course, really beautiful and have a nice view. The units down below, they look into another building. So we basically twist the tower so that those units also have a view. So we increase the value of those units just by twisting the tower. Now, the twisting of the tower also tells us that it's not a concrete building, but a steel building because you have basically the diagonal girders that are running through it. So it's also now having the ability to talk to the contractor and speak in terms of the construction of the project. So you can see how the models, the movie, gives you the chance to actually speak on a lot of different levels with a lot of different people. This is what we uh, kind of envisioned for the project to look like uh, back in 2007, and this is what it uh, then ended up looking like. So pretty close to what we envisioned. Again, what we hoped for and what it looks like and um, it's a project that basically, uh, because it's right at the end edge of town, the, the sort of the green roof uh, allows you the feel to sort of like tame the building a little bit. Um, um, this is also kind of interesting. Take a look at the water. So this is storm water. That means that all the hard surfaces in this new part of town, they drain from the hard surface into this pond. Um, 
I think everywhere in Columbus, you're probably draining the water from every road and every building and putting it underground. Now, what's really funny is that people who move into this building, they will pay more money to look at water than to look at dirt. So you're actually taking something that has a lot of value, the, the storm water, and you're putting it underground so that you can never actually retrieve the value of that water. This way, you don't have to build any canalization. You don't have to build any of those big tubes under the ground. Uh, you don't have to worry about 100-year storm events that pop up the, uh, uh, th that the system can actually, uh, uh, you know, basically pops up out of your basement. And you're just using evaporation to actually take the water out of the retention pond back up into uh, and circulate it into the air. So you're passively dealing with a problem. And what we do is that we put it into little pipes, uh, we run everything underground, we have to pay for all of that infrastructure, and we lose the value of the water. So people are looking at dirt instead of ponds. So imagine that you could actually think about cities and about making these plans and actually allowing for people to enjoy the, the water or the wildlife uh, in this case. Um, the other thing I haven't told you is that this building, 500 units, has no parking spaces. So the city is literally saying, if you move here, you're going to take the metro or you're going to bike. Because those are the two main uh, ways of actually moving around. And um, so there's no underground parking. Uh, there's some street parking. Uh, that is actually a uh, temporary parking space because this building is going to get built out all the way over. So it's phase two. So what we wanted to do was to actually celebrate the bicycle and about riding the bicycle. So we have the ability to ride your bicycle up this path all the way to your 10th level penthouse apartment. Boom. Or you can pedal all the way down. So how do we do this? We, we did it in, in a way that you can think about it sectionally. So when you have a retail space, you have to have a certain depth for the retail to function. Same for office space. But a townhouse, two levels, doesn't need that width. So we have enough space for the ramp and the green space. Then we have flats, apartments on top, and then we have a penthouse on top of that. And again, we have space for the ramp and the green space. So my, my colleagues are gonna basically walk up a publicly accessible ramp with all of the condos and apartments sort of off to the right with little gardens in front. We're now walking up, going through the northern uh, courtyard, and we're going to break through uh, from the townhouses to the penthouses, and now we're on the penthouse level. We're about six to seven levels above ground. We've never gone up a single stair. And we're just gonna keep walking. We're now about eight levels above the ground, going back through the uh, cross, looking south to the protected land, and we're now at 10 levels. So it's uh, trying to sort of take a street and make it sort of a vertical street, and then allowing for the units to directly access that street. So when, let's say you have kids, you can just say, oh, go play with so-and-so down the street. And uh, they pop out at eighth floor and just walk a couple of blocks, and then they see their friends. So it's also like, you're creating basically a, a, a means for um, social interaction within a large uh, housing project. Layers of different program. Again, this programmatic alchemy uh, really sort of working. Um, and again, the water as not only uh, storm water, but also now reflecting uh, and, and providing some very nice lighting effects. So our most recent project in Copenhagen is a park. And uh, it's a project that we work together with. It's, it's an urban planning project. It's a landscape project. Maybe some of you guys are actually landscape architects. So we work together with Topotech out of Berlin and with Superflex, an artist group. And we basically allow, we call this public participation. The idea that we as designers, we take a back seat, we create a framework, and then we allow the public to sort of be a part of that process. So uh, we basically chose an area of town uh, that had a lot of difficulties with it. This is where a train line used to run 
They tore up the train line, and now it became kind of like the, the armpit of uh, Copenhagen, where you know, no one really wanted to be. There were you know, drug uh, needles uh, used. There was gang violence. There was a lot of bad stuff that was happening along the tracks, uh, so to speak. So the city wanted to do something. They held a competition that we won together with the, the Topotec and Superflex to look at one kilometer and do something with it. So we basically uh, decided to create a red square, a black market, and a green park. So we took the, the one kilometer and broke it into zones. Then we asked the people living there, and there are about 60 different nationalities living in that area of town. So it's like the most mixed culturally neighborhood of the entire country of Denmark. And we asked people to, instead of bringing a bunch of Danish design and asking all of the immigrants to live like a Danish person, we wanted to actually allow them to bring their own objects from their own countries to Denmark and so that the park could actually provide this kind of uh, learning experience and exchange between cultures. So we, we, we went into the magazines, into the newspapers, into the radio and asked people for their input. Over a thousand people replied and then we basically filtered those into about 108 objects. Benches, light posts, uh, sewage uh, tops. Uh, um, and so it's basically like an urban laboratory of uh, public infrastructure and public uh, design. And uh, that's the red park, uh, sorry, the red square. This is the black market. And the green park, where even the bike path is actually uh, green. And these are some of the things that we wanted actually in the park that didn't get approved by uh, our insurance uh, sort of. Uh, uh, this is a swing from, uh, from uh, Tallinn. We really wanted this one, but uh, that was a no-go. Um, this swing, however, is in the park. It's uh, from Baghdad, from Iraq. Uh, this is also a funny one. Someone from Chernobyl uh, remembered this slide while, while they were a kid. And we would go to the countries and actually try to bring either the real object or source it in that country. But uh, the slide was still radioactive. So uh, <laughs> we had a copy built to, uh, to the specs. Uh, we got the real red square sign from Moscow and put it up in Copenhagen. These are bollards from Ghana that are now in Copenhagen. Um, this is also, you can almost do a study of cultures just by looking at the benches. So this is a bench that you can find in Spain or in Mexico. It's a love seat. So you're looking at your you know, Amoris uh, other and saying, I love you. Um, this is Belgium. Uh, so it's the, you know, the, the seat of the EU, Brussels, and no one is looking at each other. No one's speaking to each other. Everybody just like looking out into their own little, into their own little way. So uh, there's no hope of love in, uh, in Belgium. Uh, telephone uh, booths from Brazil. And then we had a, a Japanese fellow who played on this octopus um, in Japan. So we invited the Japanese craftsmen to come over and to build the same slide. From America, a donut sign. Uh, so you, you, you now have actually a donut sign and not a single donut shop in the, the city. Uh, so it's, like, it's also like creating this like want and desire and then not being able to fulfill it. Um, this is a dentist sign from Qatar. And these are the people who basically were asking for these objects and uh, bringing them in. So they're now also very, very happy and excited to actually uh, make this uh, place their own. So I really encourage you guys to come to Copenhagen. Uh, maybe you can... Uh, Convince to come to Copenhagen again uh, to see some of these, uh, so see some of these things. So the park was open this past summer in June, uh, and also incorporates a lot of artwork uh, into the piece. Um, so this idea of public participation, of actually encouraging people to participate with design, was also one of the focal things about the Expo uh, Pavilion in Shanghai. Um, the theme of the expo was better city, better life. And we really decided that most world's fairs are this kind of like, you know, uh, propaganda 
pavilions filled with propaganda of beautiful people doing beautiful things, uh, pictures of them. So we, instead of just looking at things, movies or brochures, we wanted you to actually experience things. So when you came to the Danish pavilion, you actually were able to ride a bike through the pavilion, the only one. So if you are, have a short attention span, then you could do the entire pavilion in two minutes. And, uh, or if you wanted to walk, then you could basically walk through uh, the pavilion. Um, but you could really feel like sitting on a Danish bike, going across the blue Danish uh, sidewalks, and getting the feel for what it's like. Um, we also wanted you to realize that you could live in a city center, an urban center, and the water is clean enough to swim in. So uh, this is our first project, uh, uh, the bathing platform in Copenhagen, and it's, a, it's basically to celebrate that all of this water is clean enough. For 100 years, when there was a lot of industry along the water, you couldn't swim in it. I think I, I remember uh, this famous story in Cincinnati, the river burned. Uh, what? Cleveland, Cleveland, sorry. In Cleveland, the, the, the river burned. So uh, that's about the worst thing that could happen. Uh, so this is the best thing. This is like, you guys can actually use the water. You know, think of it. Uh, it's not a bonfire. Um, so like, uh, it now is like one of the most, uh, in the summertime, one of the most uh, used spaces. They call this now Copencabana, right there. Uh, and uh, it, it really has changed people's perception of what the waterfront can do. So we basically brought one uh, million cubic liters of Danish Copenhagen water to uh, the pavilion to demonstrate to the Shanghaiese that they also could live in a city with clean water, if they so chose. So uh, jumped in, Bjarke even looks like a mermaid right there. And, uh, and then for us it was also important that, um, so one of the key things about our proposal was to take the real mermaid over to the pavilion. Again, the idea being that it's the real thing and not a copy. Because if it's a copy, you know, why do we get so agitated uh, towards the Chinese if we talk about, uh, you know, uh, avatars copied and pirated and software and all of these things. Um, if we suddenly also copy our sort of uh, cultural um, things and exchange and then send a copy. So we said that we want to send the real mermaid for six months to, ch to China. And it went all the way to Parliament. And you had political parties that were fighting for and against the idea of taking her away. Um, we won. So we were able to actually take her for six months and let her sort of sit inside the, uh, the pavilion. This is Chinese customs. <laughs> so, And uh, after Chinese customs, she was placed where uh, on, on her rock. And uh, we, uh, in the Copenhagen uh, kind of harbor water, and you know, everyone asked the question, well, what happens in Copenhagen while she's away? And you're like, don't worry about it. We're gonna ask Ai Weiwei <laughs> to come in and to basically uh, make uh, kind of an interpretation of her. Uh, so he basically put up this camera, which is the, similar to the spy camera that's outside of his studio that looks at his entire life. And instead of looking at his life, it takes a real time picture of the Little Mermaid uh, in Shanghai and was basically uh, beaming it to Copenhagen. Now the artwork for him in this case was that it was the only uh, uncensored live feed between China and the outside world. So you could just basically walk up here and do things that uh, in any sort of state sponsored uh, channel would have been censored. So um, it was a real interesting thing to see how that kind of quality of realness uh, really, really worked out well. There were uh, six million Chinese that came in six months to see the pavilion, and there's only five and a half million Danish people. So more Chinese <laughs> saw it in half a year than I think in the, about a decade in uh, Copenhagen. So. Uh, we're, we're working also in China on this uh, project, which is um, it's a sustainable high-rise for an energy company, a uh, natural gas company in Shenzhen. 
what is a sustainable high-rise? Well, um, most high-rises are basically inside and outside, and you basically want to have a view out and the sun comes in, uh, and you have skins on most high-rises. So what happens is that you get tons of heat gain coming in because you want to, of course, look out. Um, what we wanted to do was to create basically a passive facade. In this case, we have opaque elements and then we have basically transparent elements so that the sun, the direct sunlight, uh, for the most part of the day actually doesn't get into the building, but you can still look out. Uh, we saved uh, basically 30% heat gain by just doing that in sort of a serrated edge. So um, the, 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 the high rise doesn't need to cool the building um, as much as a normal building that uh, is just a flat uh, curtain wall. Oh, they even have big on the, I didn't notice that before. So um, uh, then you provide kind of like floors where people can actually come uh, with, with all the sort of food courts, where people can sort of come down from their office space and then they do get a share of a larger view uh, on those floors. So then you have entrances down below. So it's almost like a Miyaki dress, a pleated dress uh, that kind of opens itself, or Marilyn Monroe, uh, the kind of a dress that sort of opens itself uh, down at the base and flows uh, kind of um, with, with the condition, the site condition. So this is now under construction. This is another uh, high rise that's in Vancouver. And uh, we, we got a phone call from a developer who said, I bought the worst site in the city. And he was like really excited. Uh, <laughs> and uh, sure enough, he bought this uh, site right here. Uh, and he goes, let's, let's make a building. And, uh, and we're like, okay. Uh, this is the setback that's required for the, for the sidewalk. Um, you, of course, have an on-ramp onto the bridge, Granville Bridge, that cuts right through the site. Uh, there's a requirement to actually uh, not build in the first 30 meters of that ramp. Um, then there's a park over here that you can't cast a shadow on, so that's what's actually left uh, <laughs> of the entire site. And he, he was still very happy. Um, this is kind of what you could have probably built by just extruding that, uh, that site. And uh, there's, no, there's nobody that can make this work. So uh, it was kind of like unbuildable. Uh, but we kind of said, let's talk with the city. Because this setback down here makes total sense down at the street where there's all the cars. But does it really make sense up at the top at 500 feet? So we were like, hey, city, are you guys, would you allow us to actually take the floor plate out to a really sort of much more efficient floor plate for, for, uh, for apartments and then sort of come back to the setback? Um, the city looked at it and said, yeah, that makes sense. So we now suddenly increase the property's value by 50% because it's the most expensive units that we've actually increased. Um, and we now have a building that you sort of, uh, one of the tallest buildings in Vancouver, as you come in, the building is almost like a curtain kind of drawing back and saying, hello, you know, welcome to Vancouver. So um, it's, uh, of course, a top-heavy building and needs to sort of uh, be addressed structurally. But uh, thankfully, our developer, the guy who bought this, actually has a concrete uh, mixing company. And he has engineers that, like, a kind of work out the, the structural steel that goes in the rebar. So he had his folks pencil out how much rebar extra would be required, how many tiebacks, what would you need to do, the gymnastics to actually make this work. And he looked at what actually you would gain from all the units above, and it actually still works out. So uh, we're now actually moving forward with this project. We've been working on it for a year, and uh, it's now going through the sort of final approval processes it's a 500 foot tall uh, building with a lot of different sort of silhouettes uh, against the city. We're only the second foreign architect, a non-Vancouver architect, that has built anything or will be building anything in the city over the last uh, two decades. 
So it's, um, I think it's also something that is, is kind of good for the city because in a way it's like we approach Vancouverism because that's a very strong kind of tradition up there uh, and, and are looking at it from kind of an outside view. And uh, so even the local architects are actually very supportive of the project and of our process. Um, and we've been very open with them about the project and presenting it so that uh, they would like to challenge Vancouverism and see if there's kind of a Vancouverism 2.0 that can uh, start to uh, work in the city. Uh, we're also dealing with the street, uh, the other parts of the sites which are not allowed to be built uh, uh, that high. So we're creating kind of office spaces and retail spaces and we're, we're for the first time uh, taking advantage of the area underneath the actual uh, ramps. Uh, if you've been to uh, the High Line in New York, you kind of know that right now the High Line is also programming the areas underneath. So you have a beer garden, you have movies, uh, temporary movie spaces, so you can see Twilight. Um, you have car shows, so like you can imagine like that you actually activate that space so it actually becomes, uh, it doesn't kill a city or separate a city, it actually knits the different neighborhoods together. Now, you know, what's interesting is that it's going to be kind of technologically, um, it's going to require some technological finesse to get that, that building built. But that's usually what is required in order for you to take a, a disadvantaged site and make it advantageous. You need something that actually will allow you to push uh, some other pieces. So you can imagine back in the day when Manhattan was being formed, and if this site was only four or five levels tall, like this building, it wouldn't have, made, it wouldn't have worked out. You couldn't have made enough money developing that parcel by just five levels. But once you had structural steel, the elevator, the Otis elevator, and you could suddenly go up, and you could suddenly have three times the size of the building, suddenly it works. So it's also trying to figure out what kind of technological solutions can you put together with certain sites to actually create the most um, out of those sites, make them kind of advantageous. So uh, you go from the flat iron to the fat iron. Uh, in Vancouver. Um, just a couple of projects uh, to close with. This is uh, something that we're doing in Park City, Utah. We uh, took part in the competition uh, and won uh, for a art center. Uh, Park City, Utah, 100 years ago, was a silver mining town. And uh, basically, that's all there was, were folks that were extracting silver from the mountains. And you can see here, these are little pots and this is a cable that was, went into the mountains and the silver would come into this building, which is called the Coalition Building, and would then be kind of uh, dealt with. So the Coalition Building was the biggest building in the entire city. Everyone uh, knew of the Coalition Building. Uh, and then in 1985, it burned down in a tragic fire. So the city kind of lost its soul, its, its skyline, its kind of like, um, its heart. So here you have these kind of silver mining towns that dot Colorado and the Utah mountains, and you have these plumes of smoke showing the industrial nature of the extraction. And what's funny is that most of these silver mining towns kind of died out when the silver was kind of all extracted. So those plumes of smoke turned into plumes of powder uh, on the mountains and are now ski resorts. So all of these silver mining towns suddenly the silver mining infrastructure, remember those pots on the cables? They became basically cable uh, chairlifts that took, instead of taking silver down the mountain, you took skiers up and you were earning money the same way. So uh, Utah, Idaho, Colorado were, were actually where uh, chairlifts were invented because they took over the silver mining infrastructure. Um, to get people up the mountain and to go skiing. So everyone knows Park City because of the Sundance Film Festival, and our site is actually the headquarters of the film festival. So this is an old um, motor, uh, like gas station and uh, mechanics uh, place that has been kind of also taken over and made into a cultural facility. So these are the main ways into the town, and that's the, uh, that's the site. This is the existing uh, art center. 
and uh, they want to basically double it. So we have a gallery down below, extension of the existing building, and we have a gallery at the top. The, the gallery down below is uh, orientated along Main Street, and we've orientated the top gallery along Heber Avenue, which is the main drag into town. And then we twist between the two galleries. Um, in this case, the twist is actually quite uh, interesting in that the entire uh, facility, the new one, we're, we're ghosting the, the coalition building. It's the same scale, the same proportion, and out of wood. So we're basically giving back uh, Park City its uh, previous kind of uh, uh, skyline. And if you look at Utah, there's this incredible wood uh, construction uh, heritage. And uh, people have built log cabins. They have also incre created kind of their own stacked timber uh, construction. Uh, the Hogan uh, from the Native Americans uh, building out of twisted uh, timbers. And uh, the railroad that went across the salt flats uh, took the old growth forest from the mountains and basically used them as piles to create the train tracks. The trains are no longer going across the salt flats, so you have basically this beautiful wood that's been sitting in salt for 100 years, and now you can extract all of the piles like toothpicks, and they have this incredible texture of the salt eating into the wood. So we're going to reclaim the piles of the train. Uh, uh, it's called trestle wood, and we're going to basically mill it, and then we're going to use it as our timbers in order to create the, uh, the log cabin style uh, construction. And we're using the thickness of the wood to basically shift every piece a little bit so that we get the twist all the way up to the top. And um, so it's really like Lincoln Logs uh, construction uh, from the bottom to the top. And uh, we basically have the wood on the outside as cladding, uh, which only supports its own weight. And then we also build inside a steel uh, construction that actually houses the galleries, uh, and those are separate. So you have basically a steel gallery, which is also um, uh, environmentally sealed, and then you have the cladding and the, uh, and the facade elements, and then you have the, the movement in between those two zones. Uh, you can also walk on top of the roof of the existing art center, and then all the way to the top gallery and to the rooftop. I'm going to skip one project. You're going to see how many slides we're going through. And I'm going to end. So it's been a pretty uh, productive evening, hasn't it? There. So um, then we have the reason that I'm in New York now and the reason that we actually opened an office two years ago. So we're a New York and Copenhagen-based office. Uh, we have 50 people in New York. We have 100 people in Copenhagen, so we're about 150 people now. Uh, we have an OSU grad in New York. Uh, if any of you guys remember Doug Stechschulte, uh, he did his undergraduate here, uh, graduated I think in 2007, came to work, actually he worked with me, I was his project leader for, uh, for a few months. And uh, I mean, I think he had a ball because he went to get his master's and came back. So uh, he's worked both in the Copenhagen office and also in the, um, in the New York office now. And what we're doing in New York is this project uh, beyond the Park City and the other projects that I showed you. Um, but this is the one that basically brought us here. It's in Manhattan. It's 750 apartments. Um, and it basically reintroduces the courtyard to Manhattan Block. Um, you could say that the Manhattan Block used to have uh, courtyards in the 20s and 30s. There were a lot of buildings that had courtyards. And then once kind of like the Lieber House was built um, and the Seagram's building, uh, people have just entirely forgotten the, the courtyard. So uh, our developer, he built this project, this is built, uh, about four or five years ago, he named it after his granddaughter, uh, Helena. 
And uh, these people have paid a lot of money for the view. So there was no way that he could, on this property that he also owned in front, build a tower that would take the view away from those people. They would become irate. So he had to think of something. Either he would build a low building and thus not get all of the, uh, the FAR that he could from the, from the site, or he had to think of something fresh. And so he gave us a chance uh, three years ago now to actually come up with an idea that would preserve these views, but given his density, his FAR. And so um, the site is on West 57th. This is the Central Park. It's right on the Hudson. And uh, so it's between 57th and 58th. Um, we decided that we wanted to do a courtyard building uh, because that's what we know how to do in, uh, in Copenhagen. So this is, Copenhagen basically builds most of its buildings out to the street. And so you have a hard urban edge. The sidewalks go all the way around. And then you have this green oasis inside that you can send your kids down to play, that you can sit you know, in the afternoon or in the mornings and read your newspaper. And what's funny is that just as you have this set up in, uh, in uh, Copenhagen, this is Manhattan. And if you were to just think of this as kind of residential, and then you have the courtyard in the center of the city. So on a macro scale, it's very similar to Copenhagen. And so since the Lever and the Seagram's building, you literally have, in Manhattan, built only towers on podiums. So the podium fills out the grid, and then you build a tower, uh, and then you offset the towers from one block to the other so that you have uh, basically view corridors. And um, so this is a skyscraper. And then in Copenhagen, you have the courtyard. So if you marry the skyscraper with the courtyard, you get a court scraper. Um, so uh, it was the idea of actually having the qualities of the courtyard, but having the, uh, the height of the uh, skyscraper. So here's our site. So we take a Copenhagen block, but what we do is we lift the courtyard up one level so that you have a full podium at the base, because that's what the New York um, retail sector needs. Um, then we need to preserve those views, so we pull up the corner, and the sun can come in and bring sun into the uh, courtyard. You still have the views, and you basically uh, can uh, go to all of the uh, units with two elevators from a single lobby, and voila, you, you basically have created a new typology uh, of living for the city. It also makes a really nice transfer from the scale of the river to the scale of the city. Um, it also looks very different from wherever you're seeing it in the city. So um, in some cases, it's very wide and very big. In other cases, it's very slender and very uh, sort of uh, almost like a mountain. Um, so we, uh, if you're in the unit, you kind of come out, have a really nice view over the courtyard to New Jersey. And it started construction about three months ago. So uh, we're, we're expecting it to be finished by 2015. So also come to New York uh, when, when it's all said and done. So and here's a tiny little video. Yeah, I'm up in Brooklyn. Now I'm down in Tribeca, right next to the narrow. But I'll be hood forever. I'm the new Sinatra. And since I made it here, I can make it anywhere. Yeah, they love me everywhere. I used to cop in Harlem. All the my Disney Colonels right there on Broadway. Pull me back to that McDonald's. Took it to my stash spot, 560 State Street. In the kitchen like the sinners with the pastry Statue of Liberty, long live the world trade Long live the king, yo, I'm from the Empire State So, uh, thank you very much.
No, we, we really try with each project to see how much we can actually instill of that energy loop thinking. So I think any time that you're creating a mixed use building, there's a tremendous ability to actually allow for the different programs to actually interact and to support one another. So if you were to think of the heat that's generated in server rooms in an office building, and then you were to actually pump that heat that you would right now actually try to get out of the building, but if you were actually to have residential units in the same building, and imagine walking into your bathroom floor heated by your servers uh, that are down uh, a couple of floors below. Uh, imagine bringing sunlight uh, through telescopes uh, or periscopes into the center part of buildings so that you don't need as much artificial light. So it's really, really, uh, I would say, uh, what was it? Ah, okay, okay. Uh, so there's like, there's a, there's a lot of different ideas of, um, of uh, how those different programs can actually work together. Um, I'd say that, you know, simple things like uh, you have the landscaping on the mountain project. Uh, the water for the irrigating of that landscape is actually all the rainwater that goes into a cistern that goes and gets pumped up. Uh, the pump is driven by um, sort of solar power panels that are driving. So basically trying to create a, a landscape element that isn't based on whether you're going to take care of it or not because it's taking care of itself. So it's an, suddenly an amenity is that you walk out from your, from your unit and you are surrounded by uh, flowers and blossoming things that in essence are driven by the site itself. So um, trying to think of ways to create amenities uh, that enhance uh, a place through this type of thinking. So uh, I would say that every project incorporates some of that, but it's not the driving thing. Uh, what you're going to find is that projects uh, have kind of a driving concept and then have kind of uh, secondary and tertiary ideas that are, that are coupled with the driving concept. So uh, you're going to see the energy loop as a driving concept for some projects, but then it says secondary or tertiary idea in other projects. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting you use, you use the word sell. I would, I would actually say that uh, it's about storytelling. Remember what the office was called before big? It was called plot. And it was because a plot is a narrative. In order to have a good building, you need a good narrative. So it's the idea that you go to a movie um, to be entertained but you may also be going to a movie to be kind of taken out 
of your normal everyday life and sort of presented a narrative that makes you think, that makes you think about your, 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 your own life. And so I think that what we try to do with the buildings that we create or with the thinking and with the presentation is actually to create a narrative that makes you think, that makes you go out of your normal sensibilities and makes you sort of reevaluate how does a building go together. So also to answer your question that you just asked about um, how do we bring in the, the, the energy loops. Remember the, remember the Danish pavilion, the Expo pavilion? There were 200 pavilions built for that expo. It was the world's largest construction site. Um, it was built for six months. And it was supposed to be sustainable, better city, better life. What, what shocked me when I went was that 199 of those pavilions blasted air conditioning into a space uh, to make it habitable because they couldn't actually create a space that was naturally ventilated or naturally using the climate that is Shanghai. We decided not to blast air. We, that was completely, we call it engineering without engines. So we, we don't put in a, a blaster and, and, uh, and an air ventilation system. Those perforations in the skin, they're there for two reasons. Because they're there because they are the stress diagram of the structural system as it moves up the loop. And uh, there are points that are strong and points that are weak. So it's actually, the, the, the structural engineer was the first time in his life that he actually saw one of his diagrams built three-dimensionally. But those perforations at the same time were to allow the air to come in over the water, the pond, cool off over the pond, and then to naturally move up the loop and to go out of the holes in the, in the ventilation. So we wanted to create a building that by its form, by its uh, qualities of water and uh, shaded areas, the same way that a Louisiana plantation home is actually built so that you have verandas that shade the air to move in. So before the air moves into the house, it's cooled off. And then you place windows opposite side of the rooms so that you have cross ventilation, so you have continual air movement inside the house. So you could actually build hospitable spaces in the deepest Louisiana with the, with the most humid temperatures and make places that people actually could live. And that's what I think we need to challenge. You know, the, the engines, the engineering, the mechanical systems. The biggest thing, one of the biggest experiences that I had in your new building is when you walk down the ramp, that, that hot, I mean, that, that air that you just get blasted by as you're walking down the ramp. So someone designed a failure or, uh, or something that you actually are getting blasted by air as you're walking down the ramp. That's not working. So it's really like a, about thinking about how those systems, those engines work with buildings. Yes. I would say if you, if you go back, if you look at a project like, let's say, Super Harbor, which is challenging. So Super Harbor is that you've created a structure called the EU. Uh, so you have a political structure that now represents 30 countries or 35 countries. And yet we continuously live with harbor cities from a city-state kind of structure. You have Hamburg, you have Rotterdam, you have Copenhagen, Malmö, Kiel. So 
these, these harbor cities, are, they're fighting for their existence. Yet you could actually create a new super harbor, the, the star shape that was in the North Sea. You could create an entirely new harbor in the North Sea that would improve infrastructure, improve uh, the goods getting from one place to the other. You would no longer have to drudge or dredge out all of the channels and use resources, use money to actually make Hamburg large enough so that the super tankers can come in and take the goods out. So we, we continuously allow ourselves to kind of be hamstrung uh, by a, a previous kind of political structure when we've actually created new systems that can actually improve or answer some of these uh, issues. So if you look at, I think, projects from plots um, from that period of time, those ideas were there on systematic thinking and also of, say, uh, we, we did projects that were called like 4D, um, four di the fourth dimension. So looking at like uh, the dimension of time and life cycle costs with uh, the, the building. So you have embedded costs, you have the costs of maintaining something, and then you have the costs of, dis uh, of, of destroying it. So it's, I think, been there. And it's primarily about maybe going back to that each project kind of has a driving concept. And so what you probably are hearing are what is the initial driving concept of the different buildings or projects. And, and, but there's still a lot of different layers that actually influence that driving concept. So a project like VM, the, the housing project from 2005, that's driven by that you have, um, you have 80 different unit types and the sunlight is coming in from two sides and you are creating a space in between with no dividing walls. So it's one continuous space. The kitchen flows into the dining, flows into the bedroom and you allow people to sort of move into spaces and kind of uh, uh, create their own spaces uh, to their own family structures. Um, and it's there to also allow for the daylight to kind of permeate into the interior so that you're creating spaces that don't need so much artificial light. Um, we have a project also from the time when Plot and Big was uh, uh, coming uh, in the Middle East where we were, we were like, how can you build glass high rises in the desert? They needed so much shading and, uh, and uh, sort of, uh, 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 they need so much kind of like, uh, um, I'm forgetting the English word, but films in the glass that it is so dark so that the sun doesn't come in that when you're inside the glass building in the middle of the day, you need artificial light to read the newspaper in front of your eyes. So it goes against everything that you would imagine that you have sunlight outside, you need to bring it inside so that you can actually see what you're working on but you can't because it creates too much heat. So we looked at how can you create a building for the Middle East uh, that isn't a glass skyscraper in the, in the middle of the desert. So uh, all of those things have been addressed since, uh, since the beginning, I would say. Thanks.